Ivan on Tech wants you to join the crypto community. You gotta be in crypto, you gotta work in crypto. If you want to change your life, this is the best industry. While Richard Hart thinks crypto people are a bunch of c**ks. They're really f***ing terrible. <laughs> they're not funny, they're not nice, they're not social. He believes in Bitcoin fundamentals. More hash rate is net positive. More investment, more activity on the network. While he only cares about pumpamentals. Today, they are here to save us from crypto scams. Where are they? The people that are screwed, you guys are already screwed up. The people that aren't screwed yet are the people I'm trying to help. Look, everyone is a scammer nowadays. I am called a scammer now and then. Richard, scammer. Probably you, Giovanni, you're also a scammer. Welcome to another Cointelegraph Crypto Duel. What's up, YouTube? I'm Giovanni. Welcome back to our weekly crypto market show. This time with us, we have two very special guests who don't need any presentations. Ivan on Tech and Richard Hart. But before we start, don't forget to hit the subscribing button below. Richard, in a recent video, you addressed the crypto community in very harsh terms, to say the least. They're really f***ing terrible. <laughs> they're not funny, they're not nice, they're not social. Do you include Ivan in, in this bunch? I, I think Ivan's great. I mean, Ivan stands on stage and is a presenter and does daily YouTube broadcasts. and. He's a tall and strong and beautiful man. I don't know what more you could want. <laughs> However, I think most people on the internet, uh, if, you, if you want to know what the general population is like, go down to your central train station or bus station and go hop on board and look around and see how many people you want to kiss. And that's the general public. And then take those guys and divide them by half in quality. And that's what you have with the internet and keyboard warriors. These are people that if you paid them $100 to show a picture of themselves on stream, they wouldn't do it because they're not proud of what they look like. So it, it's, it's very statistically accurate to point out that most people do suck. And, uh, you know, we all suck in our own way. So I'm fat and old, but I'm also rich and funny. So you get, you know, <laughs> you get the good and the bad. So <clears throat> you, you are saying that this is not something specific of the crypto community. It's something in general in, in, uh, in the world. Well, I, I think if you want to point out things that are specifically shitty about the crypto community, it's that, you know, in the stock market, you don't, you see a light rivalry between Ford and GM. You see a light rivalry between Apple and Android. But in crypto, once you buy a bag of crypto, you're a diehard, zealot, religious fanatic that will stick his head in the sand to any other technologies that appear because you have a misguided belief that if other technologies are successful, that your bag will be less valuable. It's actually the opposite. All these things go up and down in value together for the most part. So when Bitcoin makes all-time highs, altcoins make all-time highs. When altcoins make all-time highs, Bitcoin makes all-time highs. And when Bitcoin makes local lows down 85%, altcoins go down 95%. And so everyone's actually harming themselves, hating a bunch of things that are useful technically um, because they're tribalist idiots. I mean, is there anybody that's like a, uh, an Apache server maximalist? or like a QWERTY keyboard maximalist. No, they're just tools. Now I want to ask Ivan. Uh, so Ivan, do you share the same opinion as Richard on the crypto community? I believe you are a little bit more, uh, less extreme on these kind of issues, but uh, let's see what you think about it. Well, it's true that many people get very, very tribal because they invest money. And as soon as you hear that somebody attacks your investment, obviously you want to protect it. Also, we have a lot of uh, new investors that maybe never even bought stocks or, or funds or anything mm -hmm. in their life before. And crypto is their first investment. So because they're inexperienced, they have bad risk management and they simply buy too much at the wrong time. And then they feel bad. And obviously, also, when you hear that somebody attacks your bag that is already down 30, 50 percent, it doesn't feel good. So I totally understand that. And I think it will change as well with time, the more we get more mature investors. Uh, but it might take quite some time. And it's just uh, true that we have a lot of inexperienced people in this space. And we're all inexperienced from the beginning. But it's like the famous quote, I think, from JP Morgan, when somebody asked me, hey, I'm worried, I cannot sleep at night, because my investments are going up and down too much. So how do you manage it? And then JP Morgan answered, you know, sell until you can sleep well. So I think this, this is the kind of mindset that uh, many people should should employ more in the crypto, because uh, too many people do not have good money management, risk management. And obviously, on top of that, you hear somebody attacking your bag, it's not good. It's not good for feelings and you attack back. I'm going to talk about Hex, the cryptocurrency that you recently launched. So you said that this was going to be the, one of the fastest appreciating assets in history. 
uh, it was launched in December and uh, right after the launch, the price of Hex uh, collapsed. In January, it was worth, uh, I mean, one X was worth less than one Satoshi. And uh, that in increased these uh, rumors, these accusations all around uh, the space that uh, Hex is actually a scam, a Ponzi scheme, a pyramid scheme. So I want to know um, what Ivan think about, before, before asking you, I would like to know what Ivan thinks about Hex. Yeah, yeah. Well, many people call Hex Ponzi and, and scam. Uh, I, I don't agree with that. I mean, if anything, a bad project, maybe if you think that, but too many people confuse the words Ponzi, scam, fraud. And uh, I think that when Richard did the project, he explained it quite well how it works. There is questions about the, uh, the adoption amplifier, but uh, Richard also answered a lot of that in his streams and who has the ETH really and whether it's an exit scam because Richard moves ETH, but at the same time, uh, it's of course either they're there or they're moved. What do, you, what do you expect them to do? So all in all, possibly a bad project, but uh, a scam, I don't think so. But have you heard of this origin address, which is uh, supposed to be to receive like 45% of all X? are going to end up in this origin address, which is supposedly under the control of Richard. Yeah, I, I know about that. I know about that. So look, if it is the case that uh, that people read everything through, they, they saw him speak about uh, Hex and they and they still were interested, uh, then it's all good. I mean, it's uh, a fraud or a scam if you mislead. And, and there are many people say that Richard misled because he has uh, advertised it as super, uh, super pump coin that's going to go up 10, uh, what is it, 10, 10, 000%, 10, 000 times. Uh, that I can understand to a bit, but but uh, to me, it's possibly a bad project. Is it a scam? I don't see it really as a scam. Okay, but can you can you evaluate quickly the performance? So how how is it going according to you? Like, would you would you put your uh, would you invest into it? Yeah, I mean to be honest, I haven't following the. I know that it was sub Satoshi, but then I saw on social media uh, Richard having that it eight x in in one week or thirty days. But I haven't been following the performance day to day. I, I don't know what the price is right now. Richard, it, now it's your turn to defend your sure. project. We're, we live in a world of noob speculators. They want to buy the thing that's making all-time highs. They buy Bitcoin at 20000 It goes to 3000 Then they cry and moan and complain and don't buy the dip. And then it goes up to 14000 and they go, oh, it left me behind. And they become jaded lovers and they have nothing but bad things to say because they got left behind because they got shaken out because they're weak hands. Bitcoin has shaken out and destroyed weak hands so many times that if you call people that used to buy uh, mining hardware way back when, when the price was $270, none of them is rich on Bitcoin because they all got shaken out, even though they used to have Bitcoin when it had not even gone up the 100X yet, right? So Bit Bitcoin has a history of just shaking out weak hands. Amazon dropped by 95%. Now it's 50% of all commerce in the United States. Ethereum dropped by 95%. Now it's outperforming Bitcoin. Bitcoin dropped by 85% three times. So the fact that cryptocurrencies drop by 85, 95%, as long as they're legitimate ones that have product market fit and an onboarding new users and are going to have, you know, meet their all-time highs again, those are buying opportunities. So, so right now, you, Hex you is up that in the last There is a 16. buying opportunity right now for Hex. I told people back then that if you enter at something and the price goes down and it goes down a lot, let's say the price goes down 90%. That means you could 10X your stack by spending uh, twice what you originally put in. Because now the same amount that you originally put in is gonna get you 10X more. So now you've actually got 11 extra stack by doubling and dollar cost averaging down. And everyone was like, oh my God, I can't, I can't believe he would say that. Oh, you know, because they're stupid. They don't understand speculation. They think the price is gonna keep going down to zero. Well, yeah, it dropped under Satoshi and now it's at three Satoshis and it was up at five Satoshis. So the people that bought the dip right now are up three X in Bitcoin and four X versus USD. If you go to hexinfo.io, you can see right now that Hex is up in the last 58 days, 2.7 X versus ETH, 3.84 X versus Bitcoin and 4.52 X versus USD. And the stupid people who were warned that maybe you don't want to buy the first day because we have a similar launch phase to what EOS did and everyone that bought the first day in EOS got annihilated. So here's the EOS chart and here's the EOS data that shows how much Ethereum came in over 350 days. And maybe that gives you some clue as to what might happen in a nearly identical launch period. 
Okay, uh, Richard, that, 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 so that's, they... that's quite interesting because, um, because you have a very specific way to promote your product. So you, several times you said that in order to succeed, a cryptocurrency uh, project like, uh, like a coin uh, needs to sell itself as a kind of with Ponzi scheme tactics. Um, I would like to know what Ivan thinks about it because at the end of the day, it's all a matter of uh, really leg legitimizing the space. How can you be successful or how can you uh, think that this space can mature when uh, people are using, are promoting their project with uh, Ponzi scheme tactics? No, doesn't matter whether they are at the end of the day legit or not, but they still use this Ponzi scheme tactics to promote their project. So uh, do you agree with, with, with Richard, Ivan, on this? I think sometimes people in the crypto space, they simply haven't sold things online. So, for example, when I promote my academy, where we teach people how to program on Ethereum, EOS, Bitcoin, uh, we have uh, affiliate links. So I can give you an affiliate link and you can promote it for me and you get a cut. For some reason, it's super dirty to do that in, in crypto. But then you look outside, all companies who are successful, they have some kind of affiliate deal. Uh, and I think most people who are in crypto who are complaining about, for example, affiliate uh, links. Um, what else do people complain about? Mostly affiliate links, for, for me at least. They haven't even run any business. So uh, I think whenever you're selling something, you got to listen from people who, who have sold things in the past. People are in crypto to make money. They're in it to make money. They're not here to change the world. If they wanted to change the world, they'd be doing medical research and volunteering in Africa. They're here to make money. People buy stocks for one reason. They sell them for all kinds of reasons. They buy them for one reason. People buy crypto for one reason. So I am the one that's popularizing speaking in multiples. I'm the one that can tell you that Ethereum went up 10,000 X on the Kraken exchange from about 15 cents to $1,500. I'm the one that popularized that 10,000 X number. I just copied that number and said, hey, look, Ethereum did it. Hex has features that are pumpamentals that can help it outperform that number. When it will happen, I'm not exactly sure. There's no time frame on it. I wasn't sure when Ethereum would do it. I didn't know it would ever do it, but I know Ethereum did it and did 10,000 X and Bitcoin did a million X, a two million X. Bitcoin's up right now about 800,000 X from a penny. I'm the guy popularizing these terms and I see other leaders of coins copying it because they go, oh, People actually want to make money. They care. Ponzi, still, Ponzi still, schemes still, still, already still, take still, our still, sales still, pitch. We need to we need to distinguish legit project from uh, so from Ponzi schemes and this kind of stuff. So I would like to know from Ivan, since he's running an academy which is teaching crypto, uh, which is teaching like people uh, about crypto and, and uh, blockchain technology. How what are the tips you could give it in order to spot a, um, a scam or a Ponzi scheme and distinguish it from a project like? Hex, which is, uh, according to you, still a legit project? Well, uh, number one is guaranteed returns. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, we see a lot of the scams right now guaranteeing returns, whether it's that they pretend to be arbitrage trading or whether they pretend to uh, to use your money to invest somehow. Uh, it, it is a, a clear sign. Uh, that is number one. Uh, number two, a lot comes to the product. Is the product even there? Uh, in most cases, no. And sometimes it's impossible to know whether a team will seek and finish the product. For example, if you look at Tron, uh, right now they're doing a lot of things and buying all kinds of companies, Bit, uh, BitTorrent, DLive, Steemit. But from the beginning, you d didn't really know whether Tron's going to be here in 2020 or not. And many ICOs are not here in 2020. That looked kind of like Tron from the beginning. And I'm using Tron as an example because many people point to it and, and, they, and, they, and they scream that it's a scam. So having a product from the start is important. And then try to understand. Look, you yourself got to understand at least a bit. Look at their code. Is there anyone? doing anything is it just a fork of bitcoin or eth or something uh, try to understand uh, the concepts behind the buzzwords because it's so easy to go you know dlt iot ai we're gonna combine everything i think it's risky in a space where everybody calls each other a scam i think that where everybody where everybody yeah. is a scam then no one is a scam and the real scams go unnoticed what do you think about that <laughs> Uh, absolutely. Look, if you're anyone in crypto who people know about, you will be called a scammer. Look, everyone is a scammer nowadays. I am called a scammer now and then. Richard, scammer. Probably you, Giovanni, you're also a scammer. If you, if you get some kind of following, somebody will call you out. Maybe even for having me, Richard, on the show, you will be a scammer, according yeah, yeah. to some people. So, yeah, it, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. People, people confuse these things all the time. Do uh, our restaurant scams? No. 
but they're the most likely to fail new business you could start. Okay. So are people that start restaurants scammers? No, they wanted to do something good, but life is hard. So price is dropping 95%. That's not enough to call something a scam. Bitcoin drops 85% three times. Ethereum drops 95%. Everything drops 95%. The question is whether it gets back up, whether it gets back up. So what does make something a scam? Fraud, lies, deceit, misleading people, guaranteed returns, arbitrage that never happens, right? Some appeal to complexity that gets people to go, oh, well, that could make money, sure, right? Uh, advanced fee fraud, oh, it's gonna be so great in the future, it's gonna be amazing in the future, it'll be worth X in the future, so give us Y now, crap like that, right? We could say that you are, you are misleading people when you said that this hex was going to be the fastest appreciating asset in human history or not. No, 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 you're missing understanding English. If I, if I design a, uh, a Jaguar to go 220 miles an hour, and then when we build it, it only goes 210. It was designed to go 220, but it couldn't do it. What amount of return was Bitcoin designed to do? Well, it's already done a 2 million X in 2017, and it was designed to do better than that and replace all fiat currency, which it hasn't done. It's got barely any adoption. So technically it was designed to do millions of X, but it just wasn't declared that way, but it was indeed the fact. Hex is just designed to outperform these other uh, products by having features that it doesn't. It doesn't mean that it will. The price could go to zero right now in all crypto. The price, the, we could have a solar flare and all our electronics could go down and all crypto could go to zero. It, and this stuff drops 85 and 95% all the time anyway. So I don't have any guarantees or any knowledge of what the future is, but I do know what is possible. And I do know that Ethereum did a 10,000 X and it didn't have the pump amounts that Hex has. It didn't have uh, a lack of miners dumping the price. There's still Ethereum miners dumping the price every day. How I explained to you earlier, that Ethereum's proof of work, same way Bitcoin is. They dump the price every day. Hex doesn't have that problem. Ivan, you stopped doing your live streams after YouTube struck down your channel twice because of some kind of problematic content. So how this ban has impacted your business and what are you doing about it? Well, we started reacting in December, in, on December 24th, uh, you know, during Christmas, when we got uh, the Christmas strikes. And our reaction was that we now collect emails. So each and every day I tell people to sign up on the email list because YouTube can remove the channel any day. And actually, it's been a reality for almost a year because the first strikes uh, came last, uh, last May, in May 2019. And they're coming, they're removing them, then they come again. I was actually harshly, harshly affected by a bug in YouTube strike system where I got a strike, they deleted it, but then I got strike on the same video again. And then they, so, I mean, it's been a mess, but it's just the, the fact of life that that channel that I have, it, maybe it's here tomorrow, maybe not. And it's not something you can do about it. But as long as it's here, it is my main channel. It is where I'm going to be doing most of my work because it has the most impact. Now, if something truly happens, they delete it, they can. Uh, but then I have the email list and then we may migrate somewhere, uh, somewhere else. But for now, it doesn't. And I get so many messages from library from I don't even remember the others but so many other decentralized YouTubes but they're solving their wrong problem I mean most of them just solve hosting that I can host my content decentralized somehow but it doesn't matter because they have no distribution and without distribution it's all worthless but yeah. why do you think that YouTube uh, targeted uh, your live streaming specifically I think it's because of these other live stream scams that are going on and it's terrible because the YouTube is also getting money from them. I get ads all the time with Brad Garlinghouse giving away Ripple. Obviously, it's a fake <laughs> fake Brad Garlinghouse, but I get, I get all the time these ads. And so live streams have been a problem, this li scam live stream. So I think their algorithm is just trying to find the scammers, but they also flag us. Now, I think that live streams could have been a th like the, the, the common denominator, but at the same time, I also see people getting strikes who are not even live streaming. So I don't know, maybe I should go back to live streaming. But as a precaution, I have just uh, switched to pre-recorded because live streams is what uh, what was my common denominator that I saw in the uh, on YouTube, people who got strikes, mostly they live stream. But now I'm not too sure anymore, but pre-recorded works as well for me. I don't really care, but live stream is a bit more fun because you get user engagement more and the community engagement. Richard, are you not concerned that something like that could happen to your channel as well? I don't really care about my channel that much. I don't even, I don't make funny faces for thumbnails. I don't put text in thumbnails. I, I don't edit the videos. I don't, if there's a bunch of hemming and hawing at the beginning, I don't even cut it. 
people people watch me because they want to get smarter and maybe they want to make some more money right they they hope that the knowledge leads them to the places they want to go in their life all that you know pretty stuff and engagement stuff I, it, it would work it would it would help and 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 it would enhance how the the onboarding of users occurs but it's it's just not been my focus so I, my next my next live stream with youtube will start with Hey guys, we're doing this across five platforms. We're going to do it across Twitch and Periscope and Facebook and Twitter and like YouTube as well. And I'm going to try and get as many users as I can to leave YouTube because YouTube has the worst customer service in the world. They have no customer service. So you get a strike, f yourself. You get, uh, you have a problem with your account, f yourself. You, anything. They don't care about you. They don't care if you live. They don't care if you die. You mean nothing to them absolutely nothing. So you've got to treat them the same way. They're basically your adversary. They're not your friend. So you've got to spread across other platforms. On March 1st, Bitcoin hit the all-time highs in terms of hash rate, which is considered a very bullish sign because it provides security to the network. Uh, Richard, you said that uh, hash rate um, is garbage, is fake security. So why do you think so? Well, uh, Bitcoin's had to roll back the chain once uh, because someone printed six billion coins out of thin air. It's called an inflation bug, but really it means you can print as many free coins as you want. So was that protected by hash? No, because hash rate doesn't protect you from bugs. Okay, so then what did we have a year ago? We had another of the exact same bug happen. You could print as many free coins as you want. That was discovered by a Bitcoin Cash developer and responsibly disclosed instead of exploited. And he could have minted as many free coins as he wanted. Did the hash rate protect you from that? No. So what you have a security theater where people pretend that hash rate protects and makes the coin more secure when all of the problems the coin has ever had have come from software bugs and hash rate has absolutely no effect whatsoever and is of no use to help versus those bugs that are the real ones that we get. And so what does hash rate really do? hash rate enriches chip manufacturers who don't live near you and who will not talk to you. And in your audience, I guarantee less than 1% of you is a miner because it costs you a thousand or two thousand dollars of money to send to some foreign country. Ivan, what do you think about it? Uh, Richard always had this uh, very critical stance against, uh, against, against miners. So what's your, what's your opinion about yeah. this issue? Well, look at uh, Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Diamond, who were just 51% attacked. So hash rate obviously is important. Now, I agree with Richard when he says that if it's centralized, then it doesn't matter. Because I think, Richard, usually on your streams, that's the, your main argument. And that also makes sense. But overall, more hash rate is net positive. More investment, more activity on the network. Uh, and, uh, and we simply have a more vibrant uh, industry as a whole. So that's, that, that's key. And now, obviously, if it's all centralized, it's on one player that is mining, then yes, of course, that, then only that player can do what they want. But miners are not one player. Yes, they are centralized. It is in, in one area of the world mainly. But uh, incentives are created in such a way that everyone is working for the network. That is what Satoshi solved, really. He solved uh, the issue of incentives by incentivizing everyone to play by the rules. Everyone wants more money. So obviously, everyone will keep mining according to the rules, because if you don't follow the rules, you don't get money. Um, so incentives, number one. And then, of course, the higher hash rate, the more difficult it is to hijack. Uh, but of course, if it's centralized, but the de degree of centrali centralization can also be discussed. It's not only one entity that is mining. So all in all, hash rate is definitely net positive. I disagree completely. It's terrible for price. The, the cost to extract a resource tends to equal the value of the resource. And what that means is that if miners can be profitable and not have all-time hash rate and actually uh, not give all their money to the electricity company because difficulty is so high, then they can hold those coins and keep them as profit and not have to sell them at mar the market. When hash rate is at all-time high, it means that miners have to sell every single coin that they can get to pay the electric company. And what does that mean? It means $500,000 an hour of Bitcoin gets sold by miners to pollute the environment. The higher the hash rate is, the more the price gets sold down, the more the environment gets polluted for security theater. It's garbage. It's no good. And it doesn't prevent against the classes of bugs. But it's not necessarily... Yeah, it doesn't prevent bugs, no. But it's not necessarily 
more electricity because uh, with faster machines, with fa faster ASICs, it's not necessarily more uh, and, electricity. And all electricity uh, isn't as bad. Yeah. It could be hydro and renewable that isn't as bad. But my appeal in this particular instance is to price. They're selling the price down as a Bitcoin miner. You give money to the chip manufacturer, you give money to the power company, and then you sell Bitcoins and that's all you do. You don't buy Bitcoins. Miners don't buy Bitcoins. Miners pollute the environment and enrich chip manufacturers to sell the Bitcoin price down. They're not your friend, they're not your buddy, they're hurting the price. Ivan, in a recent video, you said that um, we are about to enter a phase of uh, deep recession. You said even depression. Um, and that everyone, in order to face this uh, phase, needs to get at least a certain percentage of its own por investment portfolio into Bitcoin. Uh, why do you think so? Well, because of uh, different research that has been done, and you can even do this yourself, if you just uh, create a simulated portfolio and you compare a portfolio, for example, that has mostly normal index funds like S&P 500 and maybe you have uh, some bonds, and then you just add a few percent Bitcoin into it, over the past 10 years, it actually improves your risk-adjusted returns. So it just makes sense for the long term to have a bit of crypto in your portfolio, whoever you are, whoever you are. And it makes sense from a portfolio theory today. Obviously, with Bitcoin, the biggest risk is that we haven't seen it perform in a recession, how it's going to be. And uh, that is the biggest question that everyone has right now. And obviously, nobody knows how it's going to be until we actually enter a recession and see how Bitcoin performs. Uh, but th that was my main point. And there has been research done by several different entities. I think the latest one was by Binance, where they compared Bitcoin and Bitcoin's correlation to all kinds of different assets. And it is basically very, very low correlation. And also, it's low correlation compared to gold. So not only is it not correlated to equities, mostly during the past 10 years, I think they looked at weekly, weekly returns, but also not correlated to gold, which is interesting. Uh, so that's why from a portfolio theory, I think with time, it makes more, more and more sense to have a bit of crypto and Bitcoin in particular. OK, Richard, do you agree with uh, Ivan's uh, stance? I, I think it's like it's a pussy style way to advise people. So. Everyone, everyone that has a bag of Bitcoin wants everyone else to invest as much in that bag as they possibly can so that their personal ROI is the highest. So most crypto influencers now used to be Bitcoin guys before altcoins existed, and if they're in the game that long. Then they switched altcoins, you know, and then they switched back to Bitcoin. So now everyone's a Bitcoin maximalist, absolutely everyone. But what does that mean? It means that it gives huge potential and opportunity to the altcoins to outperform again because everyone that was gonna sell has sold. Now, does it matter which one you pick? Yes, it desperately matters because all crypto goes down 85%, all of it, except the stable coins. So Bitcoin goes down 85% three times now, more if you count all the flash crashes depending on which exchange you're on. Ethereum and altcoins gone down mostly 95%. Okay, well since since all these things go down 85 and 95 percent anyway well what's the difference between them really do they get back up again and how high and how hard do they get back up if but you if, if you have to make your point here okay this is a pussy strategy like the one that ivan uh, just mentioned so what would be your well, strategy I mean, look at look at warren buffett warren buffett doesn't believe in this hedging all your good bets that are awesome maximum roi with minimum risk with a bunch of other crap like there's, there's two strategies. Don't put all your eggs in one basket or put all your eggs in one basket and watch it very carefully. Warren Buffett is often one of the richest men in the world. He's the best investor that's ever lived. And he doesn't believe in this hedging strategy that other people recommend whatsoever with, oh, put, you know, 1% in, in Bitcoin per se. I think that if Bitcoin's the highest performing asset or one of the highest performing assets in the highest performing asset class that's ever existed, why would you be a pussy and just put 1% in? Why don't you put 10% in? Why don't you put 20% in? It depends on your age category. So if you're older, you don't have as much time to make back money on drawdowns, so you have to play less risky. If you're younger, which I know all of you guys are because I look at my demographics, you're all young dudes, 30, 20, 30 to 40 years old. Uh, you know, 1% allocation of crypto is pussyville. You should put a lot more in, is my opinion. I'm not a registered financial advisor. This is not a financial advice. You take your responsibility. If you make money, congratulations, you did it on your own using your own intellect. What do you think about uh, Richard's more 
a maximalistic position regarding <laughs> regarding yeah the but we're we're, talk, we're talking about different things i'm talking about wealth managers no wealth manager is gonna put 10 15 20 50 percent into a cryptocurrency uh, it's it's very very rare if, if ever anyone would do that so when talking about portfolio theory and the fact that bitcoin makes sense for wealth managers, for funds to actually be in the portfolio. It's different from talking about someone who is in crypto and is interested in crypto personally as an individual. So we're talking about completely two different things. And when you do see this research that is done by Binance and others, when they show correlation between Bitcoin and other assets, it is mostly to explain crypto to wealth managers and to and, and to capital managers. That is the main uh, the main audience. And also I was in Davos just, uh, just a month ago. And the same thing was there that you see a lot of wealthy individuals people who manage capital and they're interested in crypto because for the past 10 years, it has shown this uh, no, very low correlation to other uh, asset classes. So that is the most important thing to realize that now, if it is the case that we enter recession and Bitcoin can uphold that, then it makes a very strong case that everyone who has any kind of portfolio should have a bit of Bitcoin. How much of your portfolio is in Bitcoin? Well, right now, look, during the bear market, I moved mostly into into Bitcoin from alts. And uh, right now, approximately thirty percent in in Bitcoin, uh, and uh, the rest of the capital of, is still to be deployed. Of all your portfolio, so also including more traditional assets. So we are talking about yes, okay. yes. Ivan, uh, in a in a recent video, you said that you um, use a specific uh, DCA accumulation strategy for Bitcoin. Can you can you tell us a little bit what it what it is about? How it, how does it work? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so for most people, DCA is the best thing because look, if you if you enter the market and you buy a big position, uh, you will be disappointed if tomorrow the price goes to minus 30%, which it can do, and uh, you will sell because you will see big red numbers in your portfolio. So people who are interested in crypto, the best strategy is to be to buy a bit uh, every day, every week, however you want to. But it's DCA, dollar cost average, and for me, the most important thing is to be able to do DCA for a long time, basically endless DCA, I call it. And I'm doing that by working in crypto. This industry has endless opportunities, so many low hanging fruits. If you are in this industry and you're good at something and you can contribute, you have a lot of unfair advantages because this industry is growing so much and not a lot of smart people have arrived here yet. If you want to be in normal IT, in normal development, look, all smart people go into computers now. They understand that this industry is important. Computers are important. In the 80s, and eh, not that much, your average mother didn't tell the kid go and study programming because internet wasn't really a big thing. And the same is in crypto right now. Look, you got to be in crypto. You got to work in crypto. If you want to change your life, this is the best industry to change into. Richard, uh, I guess you are not DCAing, right? Yeah, look, if, if, if you have the opportunity to buy things that are going up multiple hundreds of percent and you're just like, ah, oh, you know, maybe I'll get in slow. It doesn't make any damn sense. Dollar cost averaging is an effective strategy in two cases. One, you don't have that much money because you're a wage earner, you're wagey, and you're, uh, you're only getting new money every week. Well, if you're getting new money every week, then you should buy every week things that tend to go up in price. But if you've already got a stack of cash and something statistically goes up more than it goes down, then you're just going to pay a higher price later on average, statistically, if you're buying things that go up more than they go down. Dollar cost averaging for a person that already has a stack of money is mathematically inefficient if you're buying things that go up more than they go down. You want to buy them as early as you possibly can. I mean, if Richard, I you, bought Bitcoin you ignore 30. psychology. You ignore psychology because when people make a big buy and the price go, goes down 15, 20% in a week, yes, if they hold statistically, as you say, they have the, the, the asset that increases the most statistically over time. Psychologically, they will not huddle. Psychologically, they don't want to see minus, let's say somebody has a big stash. He puts 1 million. Next day, he sees minus 20K, minus 100K. Psychologically, it's very difficult. So you know even, even if you statistically... If Someone should invent true, a currency which makes them work. lock up their money so they don't have that problem anymore. They could call it hex and you would get paid to lock your money and the longer you lock it, the more you get paid. We've already solved that problem in hex and we've solved a lot of other problems too. That was Ivan on Tech and Richard Hart. Thank you for being with us guys. Amazing talk. Thanks Giovanni for setting up and thanks uh, Richard. Good seeing you man. 
Cointelegraph. Like, subscribe, and hodl.